Today we'll be going over this A1990 MacBook Pro that stopped turning on. A little bit of backstory here. The customer was using it, said they heard a loud pop, and then it shut off and would not turn on. They brought it to the Apple Store. The Apple Store said it needs a new logic board and a new battery, and said that it was they were probably better off purchasing a new MacBook. Um, now that's obviously not the best case because they have some very important data on the um, SSD, which is soldered onto the motherboard uh, right under the, the shield here on all the new MacBooks. So if you replace your board, your data is gone. There's no getting that back uh, once Apple replaces your board. Um, is the battery bad in this case? Probably not. We'll figure it out. So let's go ahead and get the um, board out of the machine and let's figure out what really happened to this machine. Okay, board is out. Uh, with the board out of the enclosure, I want to take a measurement with my USB-C charger and uh, my amp meter. Now to see what this is doing. So looks like we are going to be getting just waiting for it 5 volts and 0.0, .0 amps now uh, 5 volts and 0.0, .0 amps typically means a few things so in my differential diagnosis for 5 volts 0.0, .0 amps at the top of the list would be a short on pp bus g3 hot followed by pp3 v3 um, G3 hot underscore RTC missing. Um, more rarely in this particular instance, it could be a something wrong with the CD3215 not passing um, charger voltage to the ISL to create PP bus. It could be a DFU restore as well, but hearing a pop and having it shut off doesn't really fit with a DFU problem. That's more of a um, you know, when to turn it on or did an update and not turning it on. So I'm going to kind of eliminate. Um, DFU for now, unless our findings um, are more consistent with DFU down the line. So first things first, I'm going to get my multimeter on. Now I'm going to check voltage on PP bus G3 hot. So PP bus G3 hot, I have my multimeter set in DC uh, voltage mode. And I'm going to check. And typically when we're in DFU, it can be 5 volts and 0.0. .0 um, but it's usually a little bit higher. It's like 5 volts, 0 0.12. But it, it can still be 5 volts, 0, 0.0. So on PP bus G3 hot, I am getting... 0 volts. So 0 volts could be because maybe our ISL is not getting its voltage or, or its voltage in or VIN um, because maybe a CD3215 is bad. Now in this case if one of our CD3215s is bad I'm going to switch to the other port and I'm going to measure uh, PP bus again because very rare, very rarely will we have more than one um, CD3215 not passing PP bus through. It's or not passing um, PP3V3 I mean PPDC and G3 hot through. So how this is going to work is our CD3215 is going to open our charger MOSFET. Our charger MOSFET is going to allow PPDC and voltage to the rest of the board, which will be 5 volts. The um, ISL will take PPDC and voltage, supply PP bus, which is going to be 12 volts. The ISL um, 9240 is either a boost converter or buck converter, depending on its input. And then... Um, PP best G3 hot will power um, PP3 V3 G3 hot underscore RTC through a boost converter. That voltage then go back to our CD3215s, which is going to power the brain portion of the chip that will negotiate 20 volts uh, with our charger. Obviously, we know that negotiation is not happening because we cannot get 3v3 G3 hot without PP bus. So PP bus is zero volts. Um, first thing on the list is going to be a short. So let's go ahead and cross that off. Let's go ahead and figure out if we have a short. So I am going to go into continuity mode or diode mode. I'm just going to do con continuity mode because it's easier right here and you guys can hear an audible beep. So PP bus is shorted to ground. So I'm going to check both ways just in case. But that is shorted to ground. Now let's see what resistance that actually is. So let's go to resistance mode. I want an ohms reading because that's going to help me figure out what might be wrong. Do we have like a 100 ohm short? Do we have a 0 ohm short? What's going on? So I'm going to do that and I'm going to measure right here on our fuse again. And I have a 0 0.05 ohm short to ground. So less than an ohm and that resistance. So I'm going to measure on our PP bus fuse. Let's wait for it. 0 0.0654. All right, so 0 0.04. Now if I touch my lead together, we get the same. Okay, so what that tells me it is a direct line, a direct wire to ground. What that is, I don't know. Let's start with a visual inspection. So I'm going to switch over to my microscope view here. Let's get our microscope on. And let's have a look at this board. So I just want to do a visual inspection. And on A1990s, it's super, super common for um, our SSD 2v5 NAND regulator to fail. I actually need to do a dedicated video on this because we're starting to see more and more of these every week where 
This little guy shorts PP bus to 2v5, 2v5 kills the Nans, and done deal. That board is toast. That's not getting fixed. So what I'm going to do is just check resistance to ground on these two lines, which are SSD 2v5 NAND. Now, normally, I like to see voltage in the kilo ohms. Um, if I'm like 5 ohms, if I'm 14 ohms, if I'm 20 ohms, that is very, very bad. And that probably means that this is going to be a no fix. But let's go ahead and just check voltage right here. Or check resistance, I should say, not voltage. And I am getting above 18 kilo ohms. Let's go up to our next level. I'm getting 75 kilo ohms to ground. Um, let's check on some of our Ocarina outputs right here, which are other SSD power rails. And that is above, all right, looks like we are at around 30 kilo ohms. And what's this guy at? One of these is a little bit lower, and that's normal. It's around 172 ohms there. That's not too concerning. And same thing right here, 172 kilo ohms. I don't think that's a problem. But anyway, let's go ahead and um, try and find our short. So the customer said they heard a pop. Now, what a pop tells me is something either had over voltage or it got really hot really fast, um, causing it to pop or crack or something. So I want to look at capacitors especially in this area to see if any of them look cracked, exploded. It's common these audio caps will fail around here, but none of these really look too bad. So if, I, if I'm thinking of pop, I'm going to think something visual, usually. CPU MOSFET, probably not, because that's going to present as like a 4 ohm short to ground, a 4 ohm short to ground on PP bus, and that's not happening here. So we're probably going to have to inject voltage to find this guy. really common for these guys at the edge to fail too, but these don't look failed. Th those look fine. Just looking for any excessive discoloration, any solder balls popping out, any cracks in capacitors themselves. But so far this is turning out to be very unremarkable. I don't see anything wrong here at all so far. No liquid damage either. It's dusty, but no liquid damage. right over here some of these guys can go too yeah and that's fine I mean nothing here this guy's a little bit of discoloration around it but I wouldn't think that's yeah so we're gonna have to inject voltage here because everything here looks really good um, yeah everything here looks pristine I mean, nothing of concern whatsoever. So let's go ahead and uh, inject a little voltage. We'll get our thermal camera and do some um, thermal imaging. All right, let's get our wires for our power supply on here. As always, we're going to start at about 1 volt just because I'm PP bus. Just in case the CPU MOSFET is shorted or the SSD controller is shorted, we don't want to send 12 volts right to the CPU or the SSD. So let me get a little bit of solder on our fuse here. And let's get our wire. I always set my amp limit to 5 amps because it's sufficient. Again, your joint doesn't have to be great. It's You're going to be removing it after. Um, and then let's go ahead and see how much amperage we pull. Yeah, around 3.3 .3 amps. Let's get our thermal camera view up here. And let's try and find it. We have to move our thermal camera to our board, of course, because using a thermal camera away from the board you're working on is undoubtedly not going to work. So here we go. Let's go ahead and get our ground clip on and let's find the short. Uh, let's do a wide view. I want wide view to see what's going on. Here we go. Almost looks like x-ray, but it's not x-ray. So instantly our wire is getting hot. But I don't... Alright, right here. So something in this area probably on the other side of the board and now the reason why I say on the other side of the board is because 
that did not look like a single component getting hot. That looked like a heat soak area. And if we look on this side, there's a bunch of capacitors right here that would fit the definition of what might be shorted. So let's see. Maybe it was on the other side of the board. It's really hard to tell. Let's zoom in now. That's why we have this really nice close high res feature of this thermal camera. Yeah, see we have some capacitors there. At least now I know it's not CPU, so I can up my voltage a little bit. And yeah, that is actually on the other side of the board. So let's flip the board back over. Let's see what's getting hot here. It's right around here. Bingo, look at that. Looks like it's a capacitor. And I could tell it's going to be this guy right over here. Because look at this. Look at that heat soak into the trace. It's so incredible. This camera is really high. A really nice camera. All right, let's look at this again. Being this close. Definitely that capacitor there. So let's go ahead and look at our standard microscope view, not thermal. And let's try and find this. So looks like it's this guy here. And actually, look at that. We have a chip in this. So this is what I mean by visual signs. If we look closely at this, let's get our thermal camera view out of here because we don't need that anymore. If we look really closely, there's a chip in the edge of that capacitor, and that's what that cracking was most likely. If I turn it this way, we'll probably see it more on this side. Nope, can't see it. But that's probably what that pop was because this capacitor, if it heats up really, really quick, it's going to crack. So that's probably what our issue is going to be. Let's go ahead and pull this guy off the board. Um, first off, I want to clean up, or I want to remove my jumper wire that we used our power supply for because we're done with that. So let's get this wire off the board. I don't want to be tethered to my power supply. All right, so I'm going to get a little, little bit of flux here because this board does not need to be ultrasonically cleaned. So I'm just going to put enough flux to aid in a removal and replacement of this capacitor. That is off. Let's go grab a new one. All right, let's get our capacitor. This is an 805 package, 22 microfarad. Uh, you could find this on uh, either the 8200 um, A201041 or an A1708 board, so 00875 or 00840. Um, they switched to 10 microfarad UF design on some boards, so they are a little bit scarce and harder to find in the audio circuit, uh, but they are still out there. Come on, come back. There you go. And now I'm just going to push him down. It's a little bit smaller from the A1708, but they're both the same package size. Most likely, um, one capacitor came from one supplier, and the other one came from a different supplier. Um, same package size, same 25-volt rating. Um, like I said, it, it happens. Not every single component comes from the same supplier on two different boards, um, so that is not a concern. Um, now let's check and see if our short has gone. So I'm going to go back over here to our fuse that we just desoldered our wire from, and I'm going to confirm that I have no more short. And I now have above 2 kilo ohms to ground, so our short is now gone. Let's go ahead and clean up this flux, and let's try and boot this device and see if it works. So to clean up this flux, I am going to use a Q-tip and a little bit of acetone clean all this up, make it look factory. We'll dust the board, put new thermal paste stuff, stuff you guys don't want to see. 
And then we'll get it back in the enclosure and see if it works. I don't want flux on this NAND area because I don't want any data line interference. So I'm just going to do my best to clean it. A little thin film like that is fine. You just don't want gobs of flux, which we avoided by using the right amount. That's sufficiently clean. Move on to this right here. I need two Q-tips because a little bit of that residue is left behind. And that is clean. Let's go ahead and see if this boots. Board is back in the enclosure. Let's go ahead and plug it in and see what it does. So I am going to tilt it up this way so you guys can see. And I'm going to plug in our USB-C charger. Now let's see if we get anything different with that capacitor replaced. So we have 5 volts, 0 0.37, 0 0.42. 20 volts, 0 0.19. I have trackpad click, I have chime, and I have fan spin. That is an Apple logo. This appears to be fixed. Let's let it boot up into the customer's OS. And let's hope that we have data recovery. And yes, we do. That is a beautiful login screen. And this looks like it is fixed. So um, battery is at 30% and charging. So battery is going to be fine. Did we need a new logic board? No. Did we need a new battery? Nope. And was the data saved? Absolutely. So get a second opinion as always. Don't just trust what the Genius Bar says. Um, this machine is fixed and ready to go back to the customer after some stress testing. Uh, but that's it for today. And I hope this video helps you solve your problem in some way if you come across something similar.